It is like dropping acid. You will never see the world the same again after you read this book. This is Unemployable, the podcast for independent workers, freelancers, doubt contributors, and other self-employed folks who want to own their employment and be self sovereign We may work alone, but we can be unemployable together. This episode of Unemployable is brought to you by Opolis, providing health insurance, benefits, and payroll for the self-employed. Join the community at opolis.co. This episode of Unemployable is also supported by Opolis partner, Darian Advisors, a human-centric crypto tax and advisory firm. Go to darianadvisors.io to book a free consultation, mention Unemployable for a discount. I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, and today we're talking about how freelancers can ditch hourly billing and increase their earnings. There are currently about 73.3 million freelancers in the US and about half of those independent workers are still using an hourly billing model. For those 36 million freelancers, this episode is all about how to make more money without working more hours. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Jonathan Stark, a former software developer who's on a mission to help maximize your earnings as a freelancer. Jonathan is a host of the popular podcast, Ditching Hourly, and the author of Hourly Billing is Nuts. Over the course of this episode, we will be introducing value-based fee structures and why they represent the best way forward, discussing top tips to help you ditch hourly billing and offer advice on how to change your fee structure and inform your existing clients. Jonathan teaches freelancers how to make more money by working smarter. He's written five books, sold out talks on three continents, and worked with some of the biggest brands in the world. The foundation of Jonathan's message is both simple and incredibly powerful. What you offer as a worker is not limited to the hours you put in. It's defined by the value you create. Jonathan, welcome to Unemployable. With 2020, the pandemic starts and everyone starts working from home. And we've seen that like corporate America has kind of shifted away from like, not entirely, but like boot on neck, like you need to be sitting at your desk from nine to five. My mom still has one of those where like they monitor her computer yeah. like activity. She has yeah. to be sitting at her desk. This is like a boomer company. But the, the vast majority of people I think are starting to shift to this from the other side of it. But in billing practices still seem to be a little bit slower to evolve. Yeah. What, what are the like biggest challenges with the hourly billing model? The challenges with hourly are that it puts an artificial ceiling on your income. So let's say you were billing 100 bucks an hour doing copywriting or something or whatever, web design. If you wanted to double your salary next year, you want to double your income next year, you've really only got three options. One is to work twice as much, but nobody wants to do that. Everybody feels probably like they're overworked already. So that's not feasible. Even if you did do it, it wouldn't be sustainable. You'd end up burning out and taking the entire summer off or something. The other way is to double your hourly rate, which you can imagine how that would go with your existing clients. And it would make it very difficult for you to land new clients because by providing them with an hourly rate for a thing that you do, so I'm a $200 an hour web developer, well, they can very easily go to Upwork, sort by price and say, well, you're the most expensive person on this whole platform, or I can find people who are literally 10 times cheaper than you. Are you Still really 10 times better? So, right, because you're giving them a proxy that works against you. So there's maybe some subtle exceptions to this, but in general, generally speaking, you are going to have a really hard time convincing your existing clients that on Friday you were worth, air quotes, a hundred bucks an hour. And on Monday, you're now worth 200 bucks an hour and lending new clients is probably going to be hard. That's what we could talk about ways around that. But sure. uh, most people are not going to be able to simply double their hourly rate and continue to do well. And then the last way is to hire mini me's. So you get you try and do the triage or the arbitrage of getting probably four or five, maybe six junior people like you create some sort of virtual agency and pay them less than you charge for them, mark up their time. And in order to double your income, you would probably have to have five or six because of all the overhead. You wouldn't be able to do work anymore because you'd be managing managing them all the time. You'd be hiring, you'd be firing. You'd be right. doing one-on-ones, you'd be doing professional development, you'd be doing eight, all other sorts of HR, you'd probably be doing all the payroll and all that stuff. So you'd have a completely different job that you probably don't want. And you need to ha be managing not one person, you need to have a bunch of people in order to double your income, which is fine and can work. That is a way to scale up an hourly model. The thing that scares me about it is when people think it's the only way 
to scale up a services business. And they hire not because they want to be a great leader or a great boss. They hire because they want to make more money and right. they'd really rather not hire, but it's the only way I can increase my income. So I'm going to hire a bunch of people who I don't want to manage. So that ah, doesn't go okay. well. So instead of the hourly model, you've proposed a values based billing model. You want to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So when I first had this sort of epiphany, the eureka moment that hourly billing was nuts, I was sort of splashing around looking for another way to do it. And we had experimented. I had some experience with fixed priced projects in the past and I, it had been burned. I felt like I drastically undercharged and ended up not making a very good effective hourly rate from the project. And I know a lot of people have had that experience, but the way value-based pricing works is that for a non-trivial project, say it's going to take six months or so, maybe more, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe 18, not like a two week thing, but like a real project where you and the client are going to be in this sort of collaborative relationship and it's going to take time to execute. And maybe there's like a launch or some kind of final piece, right? So it's got a beginning, a middle and an end. Client is highly engaged. You're working with at least one person, maybe a whole team on the client side. When you've got a situation that looks like it's going to be like that. So a lead comes in and you're like, oh, this is going to be a project for real. What you do is instead of thinking of scope first, which is what I always used to do when I had to create an estimate, an hourly estimate, where I'd talk to the client for an hour and I'd try and figure out all the things I was going to have to do. And we'd have these formulas like, well, if it has this many screens, each screen takes about two hours. And if it has a portal on it, that's probably two more hours. And try and find all the complicated business logic. And does this need to be translated into Spanish or, you know, all of these, yeah. all of the details of the job. And we would estimate how many hours it would be. And then we would give them that estimate and they would approve or not. And then we would eventually blow through the estimate and end up going over, which everybody hates. So the first thing that people try to do when they fix price, because they hate that feeling of going over budget and they really think they're good at what they do and they really want to stand behind their price and not burn the client in six months, they say, all right, forget it. We're going to give a fixed price and if and we'll just deal with it. The problem is they're still having a scope first conversation. It's essentially a cost plus fixed price where they're trying to uncover all of the scope first in a preliminary meeting or a couple of meetings. And it's always wrong. Like you definitely didn't uncover everything. So it's always yeah. too low. So every time somebody tries to do a fixed price in that approach with a scope first approach, it's almost guaranteed to be too low. And so then they feel like they get burned because it takes 200 hours instead of 100 hours or 2000 instead of 1000. So the value approach flips the whole model, which makes it very difficult to learn, but it is, it does work. So instead of thinking scope first in your initial meeting with a prospective client, you don't worry about the scope at all. It's not even a concept. I don't even think about what I'm going to do. Even if they come in and they say, Hey, we want you to do these things. I'll be like, well, I can do those things, but let's diagnose this situation first. I want to find out what your desired outcomes are. I want to find out what your motivations are. I want to find out what a home run would look like. And you just talk about them the whole time. So the way I describe this is in my experience, the way it'd always go is that we'd have a meeting, instead of a meeting, there'd be one or two people from the other, from the client, and it'd just be me on the other end. They'd be excited about this big project they had coming up. And they'd tell me, they'd brain dump for 20 minutes, 30 minutes about all the things that it's going to have and all the bells and whistles and it needs to be like this. And I'd take notes and I'd be like, okay, thanks for that. And they would reveal some useful information perhaps, but usually not. And then I would sort of flip the conversation once they exhausted themselves and got everything off their chest. And I would say, hey, this is great. I've got five pages of notes already, but can we take a step back, get a little higher level? I want to understand why you want to do this in the first place. So could we talk about what a home run would look like if this was a big success for you? And good clients will always say, yeah, they get excited by that question. Bad clients will be like, why do you need to know that? <laughs> and you know, they're not going to be a good client. Sure. So but a good client is going to just, yeah, let's talk. Nobody else has asked us that, you know, they're like, because they've jumped way down the rabbit hole. They haven't really given you any context usually. So then I would start what I call the why conversation. And it has these sort of three categories of questions that I group into why this, why now, and why me? And you don't necessarily ask why you can ask the questions any way you want, but you need to get the answers from them about why mm -hmm. they want to do this project in this way. What would happen if you didn't do this? Why not do this? This is going to be a big investment of money, of course, but time as well, your team's time to get this ball across the finish line. Why not do it? What would be the consequence of just status quo? And they'll have an answer for that or they wouldn't be talking to you in the first place.
And so you write that down verbatim if possible. What is the reason that they need to do this? And then you need to ask some why now questions and say, well, what changed? Did something change that made this top priority now? Or is it not really is, top priority? Is the reason for that to help them discover why they need it? And like to figure out kind of their budget conversation, it's like, if this is a priority for me, then I need to spend money on it. Is that kind of helping frame that? Yeah, it's the more urgent it is, the higher value it's going to be to them. So if something is not that urgent, it's like, oh, no, it's kind of like a nice to have. We don't really have to do it now. We just they are slow over the summer. So we figured we'd call a bunch of people like you and get some prices and maybe we'll think about it again next year. I'm immediately not interested because that's not a good yeah. fit for value pricing. But it's usually not the case. Usually they waited too long to start calling around. They probably tried to fix it themselves a number of times and failed. And they're really frustrated. And now they're behind the eight ball and they need everything yesterday. So usually there's a really good answer to this. Amazon has announced that they're coming into our market and we're afraid if we don't gobble up as much market share as possible now, we're going to go out of business. Or this is a real example. Somebody was like, we need to transform our photography business from paper to digital and we need to do it fast and we don't have a second chance. We need to get it right the first time. So we need an expert like me who wrote the book on this. So, you know, so there's always... In an ideal situation, the more urgent it is, the higher value it's going to be. It's like a direct correlation. It becomes less about how much do you build per hour and more about how much are they willing to pay for the project holistically and can you get it done? I don't even talk about money yet, really. They might use money as an answer to one of the questions. They might say that we've got all this money now, we need to get rid of it before the end of the year. So this is that made this high priority, but they're usually not talking about money yet. It's it will be like market share, it'll be like productivity, it'll be like morale, it'll be like customer retention. They'll talk about numbers, I'll try to get them to talk about some kind of numbers, like how will you know if this is a big success? And they're like, well, we would have twice as many signups on our website, or we would have you know, the CTO would be getting invited to speak at big conferences, there's something that they know, the reason that they're talking to you is they know something's wrong. And mm -hmm. there's a way that they know the thing is wrong. So I need to find out what is the dial on their dashboard that they're looking at that's like in the red and they want it to be in the green. So that's the goal. I get to the money stuff a little bit later. But so I've asked why this questions. I've asked why now questions. And then I'll ask, and that's not necessarily in this order. I might go around and around. But uh, the last then category why question, me. why me? Why are you going to pay me a million bucks to come in and do this for you when you could just have somebody on staff do it. You told me earlier that you've got an entire team of web developers. What do you need me for? You know, or why not just hire someone cheap from Upwork? I'd sometimes I'd say literally say a, a person's name. It's like, why don't you hire Joe Blow? You know, have you talked to them? I was like, oh, well, sure. we might talk to them too. But you know, our guys all read your book and they you're the one we trust. So the you know, they can either give you an answer to that question or not. They might laugh and say, oh, really a million? I'd be like, well, I don't know how much it's going to be. You know, this is a huge project. It could be. Sure. You know, so anyway, yeah, you want to find out, you want to get in their words, why they think you are the right fit. So if you get the answers to the why this, and you agree that they have prescribed the right solution to their problem, you're like, yeah, you're right. This does require an internal software system, or this does require a mobile app. And it's super urgent. And they have a really good reason for hiring someone expensive like you. Then I'm like, all right, this is going to be a home run. This is going to be great. Assuming that I'm confident that I can deliver the outcomes that they want. Sure. So, so either, if I haven't asked it already, I'd say something like, all right, this is fantastic. I've got all this information. Now, let's say it's a year from now, and this was a huge success. How will you know that it was a huge success? And they would, they'll always have an answer to this question. They're like, oh, our sales team would be, you know, d just crushing it. Our, well, what does crushing it mean? Well, right now they're doing about X. And if they were doing 2X, like if we could get to even 20% better than X, we would be over the moon. It's like, okay, write that down. If you can get that kind of information out of the client, then you've got everything you need. The proposal writes itself at that point. You just, I have this template on my website. You just fill it in. So it's like, what's their current state? What's their desired future state? Why do they think you are the one that they want to contribute to this transformation? And then this is getting all the way back to your question about scoping first and scoping last. Then I say, all right, for a company of this size in this situation, this is definitely worth $100,000 a year let's say it's a productivity workflow solution that is going to allow them to not have to hire three new admins. That's easily a hundred thousand dollar value. So, right. all right, what could I do for $10,000? What could I do for $22,000? And what could I do for $50,000 to contribute to the desired outcome? And 
those prices are based on not scope, not what they wanted me to do when they first called, nothing, nothing like that. It's based on the value to the business, the value of the result. And it's guesstimate, but you can get very close. And then once you have those three prices, you think of them like your own budget. You say, well, what could I do for, you scope last, what could I do for $10,000 that would really help this team? What could I do for 22,000? What more could I do? And then if I get $50,000, what would I be fist pumpingly happy to do for 50 grand to contribute to this minimum $100,000 a year benefit? So it's backwards. Most people think scope, 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 and then come up with an estimate or a low quote. And, mm. and it's a disaster. If you do it this way, you can't charge the client more money than they want to spend. So it's in their best interest and you can't get killed because the scope that you're setting is based on the price. So you just pick a scope that you would gladly do for the price. And then when it's more work than you thought, it's still fine because you have a huge margin. Right. This reminds me of that. Um, do you know that cartoon of the tree and the swing where yeah. it's like this? I cut the, yeah. the one where this they is, cut the wrong branch. <laughs> Right. And it was well, like, this is what the product manager heard. This is what the business, this is what the VCs oh, yeah, wanted. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. And it's all different things of how to put us. And it's like the finally what the customer actually needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. There's another joke where uh, the sales guy and the consultant are in the room and the sales guy slams down the phone. And he says, oh, the client just greenlighted the project. You start working. I'll go find out what they want. <laughs> right. And so you yeah. just, that's, and that is the problem with hourly is you didn't have the right conversation up front. You talked about scope. You did not talk about what the client was hoping to achieve. You probably made some assumptions about what they were hoping to achieve, yeah. but you didn't ask. So it might be obvious to you that their current website looks like crap and you're a web designer and you're like, oh, I'm going to make this thing look amazing, but they might not want it to look amazing. They might want it to bring them more leads. They might want it to right. get them more conversions. They might want to decrease their card abandonment. This is a business. What are they going to measure? Because they're going to measure something. What needle are so, you trying to move? In the context of this is specifically for software developers, or does this apply to any freelance across any? Pretty much anybody that bills by the hour is doing a job, not labor, not ditch digging or whatever, but sure. if, you're, if you're doing a like white collar accountants, job, web yeah, developer. Yeah. Yes, totally. Yeah. I have a student who specifically teaches this stuff to CPAs. Cool. I think on the whole, as a community of people who live on this internet together are mm -hmm. building toward a better future where we're wasting less because mm -hmm. you go to any developer who's just thinking about, this is my skill set. I'm like, I, they want a website. I'm going to build a website inside of the scope. They're going to build hourly. They're not going to get the thing that they wanted. The company is not going to grow. It doesn't really add value to anybody. And such a weight. Nope. This is what keeps me up nights. It's such a waste. It's the dead weight. It's such a waste. But so what waste. you're doing is you're commandeering just like the average developer, the average accountant to start thinking business minded of how can I improve the business I'm working on in addition to how do I deliver the product that I've been hired to Yeah, think like a doctor, build. right? What does a doctor do? The doctor doesn't, you know, you can go into the doctor and say, doc, I need a <laughs> bypass. The doctor's not, doesn't say, great get up on the table, I'll get my scalpel. <laughs> right. And it turns out yeah, you only right. need an acid or something, you know, it's like, no, diagnose <laughs> the situation first, like first do no harm. A big motivation for me to make this switch was I found it, maybe this is just me being a bad project manager, but I just, I don't know, 90% of the time would go over budget on estimates and yeah. it felt awful. I hated it. It was terrible for the relationship with the client. Because they start to over. micromanage you. They start yeah. to question hours. And why wouldn't they? You've demonstrated that you stink at estimating. Well, because it's about you're, you're supposed to under promise over deliver. And when you go over estimate, it's the opposite. Oh, imagine the feeling. Have you ever hired someone by the hour? Yeah. Yeah, me too. It, I don't encourage it. No. <laughs> It's actually a good way to get a taste of your own medicine. If you hire someone, I hired some, I remember, I'll never forget. I hired someone by the hour to read his on my website. Person never asked me, you know, in fairness, I didn't insist, but never asked me what I was hoping to achieve. Like what kind of clients was I trying to attract? None of that stuff. He was just going to make it look really cool. And I said, you know, what's your hourly rate? It was pretty high. I remember thinking it was high. It might've been 175 or something like that at the time. And this would have been like 2005. 
2006. One week later, I'm like, hey, did you start on the thing yet? Oh, yeah, I've been burning the midnight oil. I worked 80 hours on it this week. 80 hours on my stupid text-only website. And I was like, 80? And he sent me a bill for like $3,000. And it was, it, and the thing was not good. Oh, my. Yeah, and that's the feeling that clients are used to having. I've got a question that I want to ask you, but I imagine AI and a lot of these tools just cut a lot of that out because that 80-hour project is probably two hours at most for someone who's co-coding with a... Right, with it, a, it's tools in general. If you yeah. go by the hour, why would you spend money on a faster computer? It doesn't make sense. There's no reason. You Don't even think about it. There's no reason. It, you yeah, should use because, the slowest computer you can get. <laughs> Yeah, because then you could bill more hours. Yeah. Okay, so it's one thing to understand the advantages of this approach, and it's becoming very obvious to me the advantages here. But making real changes is another thing entirely. And yes. freelancers are often stuck in outdated habits and changing a lifelong mindset can be tough. Yeah. So how can freelancers make this shift to the value-based billing and focus more on the value they're creating for the for the business they're helping? Sure. Yeah, so as I said earlier, value-based pricing is hard it takes practice it's like a performance art it's sales you have to do sales you know mm -hmm. i suppose one of the easy things about hourly billing is there's no real sales it's just here's tell me what you want me to do here's how much it's going to cost by the hour tell me to stop when you can't take it anymore you know so the whole sales conversation with hourly is geez your rate's kind of high can you do a little better and then you lower your rate and that because you need the work there's no real sales to it so with value-based pricing, which I only use for projects, like I said, non-trivial, like six month or longer projects, they're at least going to be probably 50 grand. Some people start do like maybe 10 grand as their lowest option, but it's for bigger stuff, you know? So for that kind of thing, it's a great way to scale a solo or small operation without hiring, because for the first time you can actually build profit into your pricing, but it is hard and you need to have a fair number of leads coming in so you can get practice having these conversations, this why conversation, having a sales interview, writing the proposal. You need practice doing this to get better at it. And it took me probably like 18 months before I really stopped thinking about scope in the sales meeting. Like I thought I was. And then I realized mm -hmm. I wasn't. And I was like, oh, wow, I am still thinking about scope. Like I did start to solve the problem in my head while they were talking. And that's like a blown call, you know, so you need to be yeah. getting like a fair number of leads to get enough practice to do this and to get good at it. So there's that. So what are some other ways that people can transition off of hourly while they're getting practice with the project leads that they do get? Or what if all of their work is just smaller types of things? They're just not big projects. Smaller engagements. Yeah. yeah, like social media marketing or something. You do blog posts for people or something like that. I think it's fine. You don't have to value price everything. It's for big things take some practice. But there are other ways to separate your time from your money. One would be to come up with productized services. This is the best baby step I've found for most people is to have a productized service, which is a, as the name implies, a service that is delivered like a service, but is sold like a product. So you package up a service in a way that it's like a lamp on a shelf at Target. You can sort of see it. You yeah, know how big it is, you know, how long it should last, you know, where it's going to fit or how it's going to look or what color it is. You understand what the experience of it is. And you can imagine what it would be like in your house. And you're like, yeah, it's worth 35 bucks. I'll give that a shot. So that I think, especially for people who are getting their legs under them with sales, or maybe they're just, they just feel like they hate sales. They hate the idea of having that conversation. They don't like talking about money. Product mm -hmm. service is great because it's a fixed scope service that you offer at a published price on your website. So you don't have to really do sales. Say you're an app developer or a web developer, you know how to build like a SaaS, you know, maybe you're a Rails developer or React or something. And you want to help non-technical founders get their SaaS idea and bring it to life. So you get these non-technical founders have an idea for a SaaS and your whole thing is you help make that a reality. Doesn't mean you code it necessarily, but maybe you offer, maybe you don't, maybe you price that at a value-based way. But you could have an initial sort of road mapping thing or blueprint, app blueprint or pitch deck. You could make a pitch deck for the thing. You could come up with an architecture for the thing or a feasibility study or research or proof of concept. There's all these fixed scope things you could do that are in the early stage of what that project would be like. that would be worth real money to someone in this situation. It's if you know you want to build a house, you want to have a house built from scratch. 
you're probably going to talk to an architect first. You're probably not just going to go straight to a builder and say, here's some wood, start putting it together. How many hours what do you want is it going to take you? Yeah. How many hours <laughs> is it going to take? Any sort of competent adult is going to understand that having a plan before embarking on a big expensive project is a good thing. If you're going to drive across the country or across Europe, right. a map is a good idea. It's probably a good idea. You're going to have a real adventure without that. Maybe you don't want an adventure. Maybe you just want to get to California. So good and clients. For some, of our, for some of our younger listeners, a map is something that you used <laughs> before the phone just told you where to go. Yeah, it was a piece of paper that you could not refold. So yeah, that's actually a hilarious point. It's like a newspaper or something. So the <laughs> point is, I think a blueprint, I think it probably holds up as yeah. know, metaphorically, but it's like, you don't want to just start slapping a, a house together. You want a blueprint. And so you could offer a productized service. I, I actually, I've interviewed a couple of people on Ditching Hourly about this because it's a common pattern where if you're used to building, you're at the execution altitude of engagement with your clients. Like you build stuff, you write stuff, you, whatever it's, you're creating stuff, you're typing semicolons or you're in Photoshop or you're in Figma and you're creating yeah. these things, you're copywriting. If that's what you're used to doing, adding a, some kind of, I usually generically call it a roadmap, but it's some kind of strategic engagement initially where clients have to do that first or you won't work with them. And they go through that. Maybe it's a thousand dollars. Maybe it's $5,000. Maybe it's $10,000. And they do this thing that it's like an extended sales meeting that you get paid to do. So you meet with them a couple of times, you get the ideas out of their head, you understand, you know, if we're going to stick with the SaaS concept, who's the user, what are the key user journeys, like all of that stuff in your wildest dreams, how much traffic would this be getting? Like how stable does sure. it need to be? You know, can we get away with an MVP? You know, what would be sufficient? to get you to the next step? Are you trying to just put together a prototype that's a clickable prototype that doesn't actually have a database so that you can just get funding to sell the idea to investors? Or is your near-term goal to get 10 beta customers into a working prototype or a working MVP? What is the goal? It's not enough to just know that this SVP from IBM wants to solve some problem that he has detected sure. in his audience. It's just, okay. But what do you want next? Like, how can I satisfy you, right? It's as simple as that. How can I satisfy you? How can I make you glad that you gave me this $10,000? And they'll be like, well, if I had something that it was good enough for me to confidently go around and try and raise money with, I would be over the moon. So I can definitely do that for $10,000 or I can definitely do that for 50 or whatever you think. Once you do that and you create that upfront blueprint roadmap thing, they are almost always going to say, oh my God, this is so great. We, I love the way we work together. Can you build it for me? Which is what you yeah. used to do all along anyway. And then you can just decide on a case by case basis if you want the work or not. Like maybe you don't think you got along that great with them or you didn't like their communication style or you sure. don't believe in the concept of the app or whatever. Oh, well, and this sounds like a pretty good way to test out whether you'd like to go into one of these longer engagements. So probably it doesn't take mm -hmm. you six months to design a blueprint, but you design a blueprint for what could be a six month to a year engagement. And if you hated working with this client during the blueprint phase, you're like, no, thanks. I'm busy. But you yeah. can take this blueprint to somebody else. Yeah, it's portable, right? That's the way I would sell it. It's a completely portable document or deliverable or whatever it is. No lock in. You don't have to go with me. I'll be your most expensive option. You probably should go with someone else. And yeah. but at the end, you know, assuming that every, everyone's happy, then they'll say, well, I know you're going to be expensive and I know I should go to Upwork or TopTal. But could you just give me a quote for how much it would be? I interviewed one guy who said of the clients he wants to continue working with, he has landed literally 100% of the implementation phases. It's like his, it's yours to keep if you want, if you're doing roadmaps. So you can sell them, you can make money on them, you can do them. In, they should only take a very short time, like, you know, 10 hours, maybe spread out across two or three weeks, maybe at the most six weeks, 30 hours over six weeks but it's fixed price. You're not trading time for money and it's pro very profitable. And then you are probably going to get the deal if you want it to do the implementation. So uh, just changing tact here real quick. I'm sure you're familiar with imposter syndrome. Sure. Um, and a lot of these folks were saying, you know, go out, be your own boss, leave the corporate America behind, do your own thing. And that can be daunting. And, you know, people think that oh, I can't be my own boss. How do you recommend like getting over that, that mental hump to implement this? Like, yeah, you, you can state your value and get clients. 
Yeah. So there's actually a couple of things there. One I'll just touch on briefly because it's not the specific question. And that is that what happens when technicians go solo so that you did some kind of technical skill and you think, oh, I'm going to go solo and I'm just going to do that thing. Well, it doesn't matter. Bake bread or design websites or run social media marketing campaigns, whatever you did at your job at corporate or wherever, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I know how to do this. I don't need a manager to take a cut and I don't need an owner to take a cut. And they go solo and then they find out very quickly that owners and managers actually did stuff. And for example, <laughs> bringing in work and you go from having a packed calendar when you were working at your job to having an empty calendar day one. So somebody's got to fill the calendar and it's going to be you, right? So there's a whole craft to filling your calendar or if you want it filled, but is it, there's a craft to running a business. So if you're, let's say you're amazing at Figma, you need to, and it didn't happen overnight. You like had to learn how to do it and get good at it and be a, whatever, a product person. You had to learn that skill. Well, there's a skill to running a business. Entrepreneurship is a thing and it takes time to learn it. So you're not just freelancing. You started a business. Yeah. You're now two things. You're now a business owner or an entrepreneur and the thing you do as the main and only employee. So you now have two jobs. So anyway, I just wanted to call that out. So if you are freelancing, you started a business, whether you like it or not, or know it or not. And we talk about that a lot. Things. Good. So, but the, your specific question was about imposter syndrome. And this crops up in so many different ways. There's one is, there's the type of person, I have some guesses about where this comes from, but I'm not, it's just guesses where they feel like they are a bad person if they charge too much money, air quotes, too much. Yeah. So value pricing is a really bad fit for them because the profits are astronomical. They can be astronomical because the value that you're delivering to the client is so high and the cost for you to deliver the value, the simple swing on the tree in your earlier example, all they need is a stupid swing. Don't over-engineer this. And if you're not trading time for money, there's no incentive to over-engineer it. You want to do the simplest, fastest, best thing that's going to deliver the outcome because that increases your profits and theirs. Yeah. So it can be, you know, somebody will be working with me and I'll be like, I'm like, your prices are way too low. Your prices are so low. It makes me think you're not good at what you do. They're like so low, they should be higher. And I'd be like, you should double these, at least double these based on this good proposal where you outline the benefits to them and why they picked you and what your contribution will be. You charge $500. They're going to laugh. They're going to laugh and not call you back. It should be 15,000. And they just like, but it's only going to take me a weekend. You know, that's not fair to them. <laughs> and it's well, we'll then spend six months doing it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait six months and do it on that I weekend. See. I saw that the, um, the Ditcherville where yeah. the, he goes like on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Or six months to the island. Yeah, turtles. You're done already. We paid you fifty thousand dollars. He's like, "How long did you think it was going to take?" More like six months. He goes on vacation, comes <laughs> back. Okay, I'm done. That's more like it. Yeah. So there is a whole bunch of wacky money psychology thing. It's not. I wouldn't exactly call it imposter syndrome. It's well, something else. It's I this think pro profits are evil kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I think there's another vein. I'm sure you have a comic. I just haven't found that one yet. <laughs> where it's not about how much time it takes you to complete the project. It's they're also paying for the amount of time that you spent learning that craft to be able to, you're not paying a doctor for the one hour surgery. You're also paying for the eight years of medical school and the years of practice to, to do the thing right. Yeah. There's a joke about that or a apocryphal story of, you know, a lady walking up to Picasso in a cafe and asking if he could do her portrait and he charged her like $5,000 for it or something. So $5,000, it only took you 10 minutes. And he goes, no, it took me 20 years. And yeah. I don't really subscribe to that. I might've made a joke like that in Ditcherville, but I don't really subscribe to that notion because it's still, you're still thinking about paying for time. I mean, I understand the point of the story, but what well, the, the point is to not pay for time, right? Right. So it's so to pay for expertise like, and value results results, right? So if you're a brand new doctor and somehow you're just this whiz kid Doogie Hauser, and you can do my brain surgery and guarantee 100% that it's worked and it's worked for the last hundred people you did, 
I don't care if you spent eight years in medical school or eight minutes. I don't care. It's like the result mm. is what you want. So because the, the problem with the I've been a graphic designer for 20 years, I should be worth more than this or people aren't paying That's my point. Money. It's no, you could suck just yeah. because you've been doing it for a long time. You know, I don't mean to be harsh, but when I say suck, you might make beautiful stuff that doesn't work. So the client wants it to work like design yeah. isn't what it looks like. It's how it works. Right. So if you come in and you are just make these beautiful websites for people who don't really care what it looks like, they just want more leads and you're not getting them more leads, then the site is broken. It might be beautiful and you might get an award for it and you might want to put it in your portfolio. But if it doesn't do the thing the client wanted, it's broken. Yeah, it's not good. So how long you've been doing this to me is it's not totally irrelevant. You can't you can't stink at it. You need to be able to you need to know what you're doing. But let's just assume people know what they're doing. If you focus on delivering business benefits and nothing else, it will change the choices that you make during the project. Do you have any like general advice for folks on like defining that value during that negotiation or sales process? The whole idea of saying charge what you're worth doesn't even make sense. It's a non sequitur because you're not worth anything in general. You're not worth anything yeah. like it. I mean, everybody's worth as a human exists, but in a business context, the buyer defines the value. The buyer defines what it is worth to them. So what you're worth in a transaction depends on who the buyer is. If you are like a trusted logo designer and for whatever reason, people trust you, they think your stuff is great. Like Paul Rand, was that his name? Paul Rand, he supposedly would charge a million dollars for a logo because he was famous. If a mom and pop pizza place came in and was like, hey, we saw you, we saw you in the yellow pages, you design logos, how much is it going to be? And he'd say a million dollars. It's not worth it to the mom and pop shop to pay that because they're not going to get the ROI. Yeah. They're just not. So it's not worth it to them. He's not worth a million dollars. He might be attracting clients on a regular basis who are willing to pay him a million dollars, but that doesn't mean he's worth his work is worth a million yeah. dollars to everyone. That's an interesting. I was thinking about that from the other side where it's like you design a, maybe a logo or a website and that website can help a large company, you know, 10 X we go from a billion dollars in revenue to $10 billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. Like that's a lot of money that you have made that company. Yeah. So that's it's not, the core it's not about the core yeah. premise of value pricing is the way that you scale up a business with value pricing is to get bigger and bigger clients, clients who have bigger, more and more buying power, where the ratchet, the upward ratchet, if you're going to use that approach as you're scaling your leverage, is to become more and more famous for delivering outstanding results so that bigger and bigger clients will want you, want you specifically, yeah. and have a bigger, more buying power because they're going to get more benefit. Because exactly like you said, if I create a checkout page for mom and pop pizza place, even if it was a huge success, they're going to hit capacity so fast that they still only make yeah. them 20% on a hundred pizzas a day at the most. It doesn't work out to that much money. But if I do the online ordering system for Domino's that is going to scale, you know, to 45,000 locations worldwide, if I can move the needle 1%, it's probably worth a billion dollars. So I can charge easily charge a hundred thousand. I'd probably have to charge more to be taken seriously. The solution I think to imposter syndrome is the same solution to starting to understand your value to a buyer, not your value in general. And it starts with testimonials. So if you've been doing good work for people, reach back out to them, say, Hey, I'm updating my website. Would it be okay if I sent you over a few questions about the work that we did together? It's fine if not, but you know, I'd love to get your input. They're all going to say yes. They'll, they won't get around to it for three months, but they'll say <laughs> yes, and then eventually they'll do it. And if I have a page on my website where it gives you the exact six questions to ask them so that you get results-oriented testimonials instead of this sort of professional courtesy like, oh, they, he was so responsive or she was great to work with. It's, that's nice, but you want numbers. You want them to say, you know, Rob doubled our income or, you know, Sally decreased our cart abandonment rate by 30%, which represented a million dollar gain. You know, you want those kinds of testimonials. And if you're getting those kinds of testimonials, you be like, I can't believe it, but I am delivering amazing results. And if you're finding that information out, it's going to automatically allow you to do a better job 
looking for value in a sales interview, and also justifying your fees to yourself and to your next clients. Because look what I did. Look at these charts. <laughs> you know, it's just if you're delivering mind blowing results, then it makes sense to charge more. It makes sense to not feel like an imposter. And you can just my website's littered with testimonials. And it's very reassuring to me. I'm like, all right, so like, I've been, I feel like I've been saying the same stuff for 10 years. Am I just repeating myself? Does this actually work? And then I can be like, oh, no, it does work. These people have measurable gains in their business. So okay, I'll keep doing it. I'll keep doing it. Imposter syndrome and value thinking all starts with testimonials. So go back to all your past clients that were happy and ask them. Have you gotten to the point where you're only with those top tier clients or do you still work with smaller businesses? I stopped that business a while ago. Well, the most of the project work I did was when I considered myself a coder. And that would have been the 2000 to 2010 where I was coding. And I was like literally building software for people. And I would do project prices based on value for those. And that was great. Mm -hmm. And then in 2010, I wrote a book for O'Reilly that was, it came out in January called Building iPhone Apps with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it was very pop The timing was perfect. It was the first book like of its kind. Mobile was cool. just getting popular with the enterprise. And it completely took off. And I started speaking at conferences and doing consulting. I wasn't building stuff anymore. And so for roughly a 10-year period, I did consulting. And I did some value price projects, but I had moved on to a productized service that I would call an advisory retainer, where these companies would have all like the companies you listed were, I think, all from my consulting phase, where <clears throat> some early adopters were trying to make some moves into mobile. So somebody like TechCrunch was one, Staples was one, Time Magazine, or Time Inc, rather, Entertainment Weekly, sure, Cisco, you know, the list goes on. There was somebody in each one of those companies who was, and even 2010, at the corporate level, these were still people who were like early adopters. And they were like, mobile's going to be huge. Mobile's going to be huge. Mobile's going to be huge. We need to do something about our website. Who is the best? We want to make a big splash. We want it to be amazing first try. And I wrote the book on it. And so they'd go to their web developers and they were like, who knows how to do this? And everyone would hold up the book. And so I would get these advisory retainers. By the end, it was exclusively advisory retainers where people would pay me, you know, five figures a month to pick up the phone and answer their questions when they had questions. And so I, you know, maybe go to, there was some travel involved. So, you know, I'd go to the Cayman Islands is that, that Cayman Islands joke is because I used to go to the Cayman Islands like once a quarter to meet with the client and like sure. make strategic decisions about what we're going to do next in terms of the next application or what architecture should we use and so forth. I spent all of my time just keeping up to date on mobile and, you know, like when a new iPhone would come out or a new operating system would come out. I'd spend days just testing the thing like crazy and then alerting my clients to anything that was going to break or something that we knew that we could take advantage of. Like, oh, it's got geolocation now. We can finally do that thing. Or now I've got camera access. We oh, can neat. do that thing. Yeah. So that was my income for many years. Like I'd have two or three clients paying me 10 grand or so a month to research the iPhone. And then when Android came out, that too. And then advise them on what they should, what their mobile strategy should be. So we we sit kind of in the web 2.5 space, the Opolis, the, the sponsor producer of this podcast, we help freelancers to access employment benefits and we service maybe about 60% DAO and web three contributors because they get paid in crypto and we process it through and give them a paycheck. A year ago, you did a pod, I think his name is Kyle, where you, it sounded like you were pretty well versed in like web three, the kind of the Ethereum ecosystem. I kind of want to ask if you've kept up with that and if you still have the kind of the same thoughts on the space. So crypto represented something, an intersection of three of the biggest topics of interest in my life, especially when NFT said, I was like, okay, I really need to look at this because I, my background's in music first. Sure. I went to music school and tech code, you know, I'm like super, in, I love coding. I don't want to do it for money, but I love coding still and value or money. So it was like all three of those things were all sort of wrapped up in blo blockchain more broadly. And as a geek, I was like sort of interested in it. I think all of that crypto stuff brought out three new really interesting primitives for the web. The 
immutable ledger. That is amazing. It's an amazing concept. I still don't know what we're going to use it for, but it's amazing. The concept of a wallet. If there was a wallet on every browser on the planet, that would be really wild. That would be transformative. And the last thing is a coin or a token like that. Yeah. It's super interesting. And I, you know, I'm with most people that were like, I'm on Twitter trying to figure out like, what is all this excitement about? This is just speculation, right? Like you're all just excited about the speculating on these ICOs and it's still get rich quick for most of the coins. I think Ethereum, the smart contract stuff, terrible name, by the way, but smart contract stuff is very interesting. Because they're not smart or contracts. Yeah, it's stupid. It's <laughs> the stupidest name. Anyway, I don't know what I would have named it, but that name is just so confusing. I had to like learn a little bit of solidity, which wasn't that mm -hmm. was easy, but learn a little bit of solidity and build one of these things for me to understand what the heck was everyone talking about. Yeah. And that was the game changer moment for me because I was like, wait a second, this variable has literal money in it. You know, like you step on that variable and you just erased five grand, right? You have some like logic error in your program. Anyway, so it's a fascinating little thing, but it's compare that to like the meteoric rise of chat GPT, right? Like blockchain, all of that stuff, all the crypto stuff. It's interesting. I just don't see the killer use case. If you're like the sort of libertarian, you know, it's the self dare, custody. It's the my keys, yeah. my coins. Yeah. Very few people want that. Most people don't care about that. I want to be able to call my bank and recover my password. There are a lot of safeguards built into the existing financial system. Is it perfect? No. Is it bizarre that the United States can like just print more money? It's bizarre. Yeah. Like I, I get all the arguments, but I just don't see a mass market use case adoption. Coinbase, I feel like did the more than anyone to make it mainstream. But it sounds like you're way more into the space than me. I mean, I paid my taxes in crypto a couple of years ago. It's interesting. It, it You can, I don't know. But you compare that, just take that, Gart you know, the Gartner hype cycle. Yeah. So that was massively hyped. And I'm like, okay, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's going to be around forever, honestly. I think it will. I think a great use case will catch on. I just think it's going to take way longer than anybody wanted. And having wallets and everything would be amazing. And that would be a real game changer. I think it, it has to do with the fact that a lot of it's still like for devs by devs. Like for nerds by nerds, it's still much a, sm a smaller niche. And um, all of the guts are on the outside. Nobody knows how HTTPS works or why. They just know that S means secure or like TCP IP. I, you're like, nobody knows how the internet works, really, but they use it. Mass market, right. Yeah. And so what, what we've done is like the Web3 ecos is all about transparency. So they're like, let's be transparent about everything. And, and like the consumer the doesn't care. Nobody wants to know. Yeah. Like, how does this work? They just want it to work. Yeah, right. So I, it's, I don't think it's going to go away. I think the, the sort of volatility of Bitcoin and Ethereum, it, over time, it's still in this crazy upward trend. So I, I think that will continue. I just, I wanted to research it to get my head around it. I did get my head around it, and then I lost interest in it. So interesting. Yeah. Anyway, compare that to ChatGPT where, you know, they had a million users in five days and a hundred million in like two weeks or something. And they're at a billion now, six months yeah. later. So it's like obvious. The guts are on the cases. inside. Guts are on the inside. We yeah, couldn't be more on the inside. The people who wrote it don't even know what it's doing. So, <laughs> right. The guts are way on the inside. And yeah. but the use, use cases abound. The government is trying to restrict places where you can use it because there's so many use cases. It's like everything has a use case, it feels like. So I don't know how we got on this, but it's a great example. I use ChatGPT every single day in MidJourney and in others. And what does that do? That collapses my costs. I don't have to pay for stock photos or I don't have to hire someone to yeah. do this design or I don't have to have a co-author or I don't have to have someone edit my videos down into individual shorts. If you're, oh, that's if cool. You're, if you're trading time for money or transcribe my podcast or summarize my podcast or whatever... All of that stuff, I wasn't paying for it before. I just wasn't doing it. So, but now since I can do it almost for free, now I'm doing more stuff. So I didn't like, it didn't put someone out of a job in my case, but I'm sure it would put certain like labor intensive knowledge work out of biz unless they embrace it and their, their cost structure is not, or their billing business model is not trading time for money. Now you can 
charge a ridiculously competitive price that is still super profitable for you because it took you now can do a week's worth of work in one day, charge half of what you're charging before and have doubled your profit. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking like, Joe, my producer's getting worried. Don't worry, Joe. We have a good relationship. I'm like, I'll replace you with AI. You're like, wait a minute. What's that shorts thing? How did he do that? (laughs) (laughs) Broke the fourth wall. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. It's a great incentive. Like the people that are sort of scared of AI. Look, I don't know what's going to happen. It could be too sudden of a shift and have really bad effects on the labor market. It could be bad. I think it it is growing into... It's like water on concrete. It's like it's getting into everything faster than I think people understand the repercussions. My dad's a professor. They've taken this like no AI policy and they've just been like banning. And they're like, no, don't use it. And I saw um, there's some high schools now that are like, they're giving kids assignments to engage with ChatGPT. It's like, write this essay, give it to ChatGPT and try to figure out the differences and what did it come up with and why and like understanding it. I think that's the much better approach to like getting people to understand the technology. Yeah. The other approach is la, 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 la. It's not happening. Yeah. Right? That doesn't seem like a good move. So yeah. yeah. Do I think it's going to be all roses? Absolutely not. There's going to be upsides and downsides to it like any tool, but ignoring it seems like a really you, big mistake. While we're on that topic, I have a subscription to both. Do you have any advice? Because it sounds like you use both very competently. Any advice on prompt generation for our unemployable audience? My experience so far has been that I started out prompting it almost like I would do a Google search. Yeah, that's why I still do. You don't need to do that. You can be more like you're starting a conversation about something with someone and you get more surprising results that way. So I would do something like just to over exaggerate it, thinking about writing a book ever. That's great. What would you like to write about? I think it's going to be like a sci-fi thriller. What are the obligatory scenes in a sci-fi thriller? Oh, well, here are some examples. And oh, if it's going to be like, should I use the hero's journey? Or it might suggest hero's journey. I'd be like, what's hero's journey? Oh, Joseph Mm. Campbell. You know, it's way more like a conversation. I find it more useful when I'm doing it like that. Instead of when I used to do it, like more like a Google search. I was really limiting what it could tell me because the question was so specific. Right. The question is like limiting the surface area of question of answers that I can get back. This kind of feels like a direct line to the engaging with clients to figure out scoping where it's like you ask a question, you're going to get an answer. But if you open up a conversation, they start asking you questions and then it becomes a more fulfilling conversation or more productive. All of the things that people talk about is bad. The plagiarism thing is totally real. But if you're asking it to do things that you know the answer is correct, if I ask it to summarize a podcast episode, yeah, I know it's right. I'm like, yeah, I remember. Yeah, these are the things we talked about. These are the timestamps. So check it. Yeah, that's the timestamp. So yeah. it's not wrong. And it's not plagiarizing because I just did it. So for certain things, for certain categories of task, you can skip the current sort of bleeding edge downside things and just you're like well that just saved me a ton of time so yeah cool. I, we don't, we don't I, I don't know I, if you get me going about chat tpt you're going to talk for two hours <laughs> i don't know if i think just to... th- things that you're passionate about are much more compelling than just questions that i've got i like these kinds of conversations much better than the i mean they're Talking not points. sterile i try not yeah. to be sterile here's a good way to tie it back to the sort of right in your face right in your world freelancer stuff is you're running a business. Even if you're the only employee, you are running a business. So you are two people, the business owner and the freelancer. And if you're not renting out the freelancer by the hour, anything you can do in your business to create leverage is money in your pocket, as long as you're not renting out your hands by the hour. So if you can, even shed GPT aside, if you can automate things, automate them. If you can build, you know, info products that package your expertise in a way that is more affordable to more people then do it. You know, if you can use chat GPT to take out some annoying piece of your, you know, checklist or SOP for producing your podcast, let's say, then do it because all of that is money in your pocket because that's, it's like you making the same amount of money working fewer hours. So if you can cut the number of hours you work in half and still make the same money, you've doubled your profitability, which as we started out saying, 
you almost literally cannot do with hourly billing. It's very, very hard to double your income with hourly. It's just yeah, it, for reasons we already discussed. So any yeah. way that you can create leverage in your business through automation, productizing, info products, you know, AI, whatever the case may be, is going to be probably a good investment of time. I would add that another way, of course, this is my bias, but another mm -hmm. way to uh, add to your bottom line is to cut costs. Uh, and what we do at, at Opolis is help freelancers to cut costs. So with Opolis, what we do is we take all of the freelancers who join startup founders, creators, we bundle them all together and we do group negotiation for billing. So instead of you know, a startup will go to like Gusto or something and they'll, you know, one, 10, 15 employees and they won't really get good rates on healthcare, dental, vision. What we do, we've got 500 and mm. growing. And so we're able to go to Cigna and say, no, give us a better deal. Um, Interesting. And then, yeah, and you're right, paying, I agree. Cutting costs is another way to scale up. Yep. Yeah. A few of your guests talk about like making quarterly payments and having to do these filings. And what we do is we cut out on that as well. So we take, most people are set up as an LLC, or if they're not, we help them set it up. All their income streams go into this entity. Then we process the payroll for them, paying the Social Security, Medicare, workers' comp, and employment. But then they get a paycheck on the first and third Friday of each month. And so we're doing this withholding. And so the business doesn't have to pay quarterlies anymore. And then you're not getting this big tax bill in April the year. Yep. You're all surprised about. Yeah, that's great. I, I just went through the process. I just left Gusto and was getting reset up with a local payroll company that my accountant likes. And it's, you know, it was a lot of paperwork. It was a pain. But if you're not doing that, you're going to just, you're just going to bury yourself. If you're not you done with that to... process yet, we'd love to to have you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will, I will keep that in mind. I did complete the process, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's lowering your costs. My experience is most probably healthcare is the highest cost any freelancer probably has. They probably don't have an office. Maybe they have a laptop they have to buy every couple of years, maybe a hundred bucks for internet. It's not usually a high cost compared to an asphalt company that, yeah. you know, has to finance dump trucks, you know, things like that. So it's like cost structures. It should be massively profitable, you know? So if you could just price based on yeah. the results that you're delivering. Yeah. We've been meeting some people in like California, New York, who pay like $3,000 a month in health insurance. Because like as you get older, when you're in private practice or you're buying off the exchange, they age band it. Mm. And then they also do the pre-existing conditions. And mm. we don't have any of that because it's employment based. So it's recreating the employment structure, but you work for yourself, which is uh, mm. that's very interesting. one of my favorite pieces. Yeah, that's good. I, I would keep that in mind for other folks because, yeah, I hear it all the time. The health insurance thing is ours isn't. 3000 but it's high. It's probably our yeah. second biggest expense. Yeah. Well, I was going through your podcast and I was listening and, and like every episode, I'm like, damn, this person could use Opolis. <laughs> it's like the same complaints over and over again. That's like, we're working to solve that problem. Cool. As we wrap up, would love if you could drop some of your favorite resources, content that, that you point people to either new freelancers or existing and leveling up. Okay. So Probably if you're intrigued by the idea of value-based pricing, there's a ton of information on my site, but there's a book that is called How to Measure Anything by Douglas Hubbard. He's got a couple of versions. There's like a cybersecurity one, but just get the oldest one. It's just called How to Measure the Intangibles or Business Intangibles, something like that. Okay. And it is like dropping acid. You will never see the world the same again after you read this book. And it's like, how do you measure thought leadership? It's like you can't. Well, guess what? You can measure anything because you have to redefine what the word measurement actually means. And when you do that, it becomes extremely useful. And it is direct. It's not about value based pricing, but it is specifically the kind of thinking that you need to do a good job in that why conversation. Really good. That's great. I'm a gigantic Seth Godin fan. So if you're not already familiar with Seth Godin and you know you're not doing a good job of marketing yourself, I would say think about taking the next version of the marketing seminar. It's fantastic. I've gone through it twice and built workshops with using the same story. It's very interesting. It's really good. If that's too much of a lift, there's a book based on the course called This is Marketing. But for folks, you know, 
you're running a business. Like you might call yourself a freelancer, but you are running a business and you need to yeah. do all the business stuff. Peter Drucker said, and I agree, that the two core value creation centers in a business are innovation and marketing. Everything else is a cost. So if you're not doing innovation and marketing, both you're leaving money on the table, you're not doing being as profitable as you could be. Innovation, especially for developers, that kind of works itself out a little bit because they love playing with their tools and making new things. And that's sort of natural. People want to keep their skills sharp and that sort of thing. But the marketing piece, people just have a dramatic misunderstanding of what marketing is. They think it's sleazy used car salesman kind of stuff, annoying pop up ads and those sorts of things. But marketing done well is invisible. It looks like education. It looks like great customer service. It looks like a yeah. powerful brand. So if you aren't consciously doing a good job of marketing yourself, check out either the marketing seminar or that book, This Is Marketing, and start to get your head wrapped around what good marketing is because it will change the game completely for you. Okay. And then w which of your books do you think is the most useful for the unemployable audience? I wouldn't even send them to a book, honestly. If it's value-based pricing you're interested in, I've got a free email course called Value Pricing Bootcamp. So you can go to valuepricingbootcamp.com and it'll redirect you to a page in my site. And you can email me through that. It comes from my personal email, so you can just reply to anything and I'll get it. If you if you still aren't convinced that hourly billing is crazy, then probably by hourly billing is nuts. Or if you know someone who says, no, hourly billing is greatest, it's the only ethical way to price your work, which I could just rip that statement to shreds all day long. If you or someone you know is not convinced that hourly billing is nuts, then I would buy that book. But I probably after listening to this or listening to my other <laughs> podcast, then they won't need that book. Yeah. So I'd say valuepricingbootcamp.com. Okay, cool. Is there a paid a course that we can sure i mean i've got a bunch of workshops here. i have a i've got a membership community that's probably the best bang for the buck of anything called okay. ditcherville it's called ditcherville same as the comic and you know it's in a slack room and i do sort of like office hours every other week for an hour 90 minutes we do live q a uh -huh. on video and uh, is that based on well then i mean it, thinking about the tokenization of it is it like, you could token I thought about it, it. I thought about it. And I was also looking for a way that it could sort of survive if I get hit by a bus, which a DAO sort of seems like that promise, but it, it, it maybe in the future, but I haven't done that yet. And so right now it's, uh, yeah, it's 99 bucks a month and there's 600 and something people in there. And it's all people like this that are mostly all soloists, not everybody, but mostly all soloists are small firms who are trying yeah. to get their heads around and get better at having the Y conversation, coming up with productized services, coming up with info products, starting a mailing list, starting a podcast, all of those things. So it's a great place. There are lots of communities for freelancers. The difference here is that everybody's drunk the Kool-Aid that hour, hourly billing is nuts. And so they're all on this cool. journey to get away from it. All right. Lastly, where can people find out more about you? What are your handles and websites? JonathanStark.com. Yeah. There's a right on the homepage. There's sort of like first time here. Here's 10 popular links. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Anytime. As always, to the unemployable community, I'd love to hear your reactions and thoughts to the episode. You can tweet at the show at Opolis with the hashtag unemployablepod. At Unemployable, I'll always be looking ahead to see what's on the horizon and bringing you top strategies for thriving in the new economy with freedom, flexibility, and peace of mind. I hope you got a lot out of this episode on Ditching Hourly. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast player. Your ratings and reviews help other unemployables find the show. Until next time, I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, a founding steward of Opolis, co-founder of SportDAO, Mantle Diplomat, value-based pricing advocate, and tenured professor here at Unemployable University. Hey, I'm Jonathan Stark, and I am super unemployable. Okay.